Rock Island Express, Chapter 2 of 4, so great was the public interest in the crime and the mystery surrounding it that three separate, well-organized investigations of it were undertaken. The Rock Island Railroad officials, with their detectives, conducted one, a Chicago newspaper, the Daily News, with its detectives, another, and the Pinkertons, in the interest of the United States Express Company, a third. Mr. Pinkerton, as we have seen, concluded that the crime had been committed by railway men. The railway officials were naturally disinclined to believe ill of their employees, and an incident occurred about this time which turned the investigation in an entirely new direction and made them the more disposed to discredit Mr. Pinkerton's theory. This was the receipt of a letter from a convict in the Michigan City Penitentiary, named Plunkett, who wrote the Rock Island Railroad officials, saying that he could furnish them with important information. Mr. St. John, the general manager of the road, went in person to the penitentiary to take Plunkett's statement, which was in effect that he knew the men who had committed the robbery and killed Nichols, and was willing to sell this information in exchange for a full pardon, which the railroad people could secure by using their influence. This they promised to do if his story proved true, and Plunkett then told them of a plot that had been worked out a year or so before, when he had been grafting with a mob of pickpockets at county fairs. There were with him at that time, Butch McCoy, James Connors, known as Yellowhammer, and a man named Jeff, whose surname he did not know. These three men, Plunkett said, had planned an express robbery on the Rock Island Road, to be executed in precisely the same way, and at precisely the same point on the road, as in the case in question. The story was plausible, and won Mr. St. John's belief. It won the belief, also, of Mr. Melville E. Stone of the Daily News, and forthwith the railway detectives, working with the newspaper detectives, were instructed to go ahead on new lines, regardless of trouble or expense. Their first endeavor was to capture Butch McCoy, the leader of the gang. Butch was a pickpocket, burglar, and all-around thief, whose operations kept him traveling all over the United States. The police in various cities having been communicated with to no purpose, Mr. Stone finally decided to do a thing the like of which no newspaper proprietor, perhaps, ever undertook before, that is, start on a personal search for McCoy and his associates. With Frank Murray, one of the best detectives in Chicago, and other detectives, he went to Galesburg, where the gang was said to have a sort of headquarters. The party found there. None of the men they were after, but they learned that Thatch Grady, a notorious criminal with whom Butch McCoy was known to be in relations, was in Omaha. So they hurried to Omaha, but only to find that Grady had gone to St. Louis. Then to St. Louis went Mr. Stone and his detectives, hot on the scent, and spent several days in that city searching high and low. The method of locating a criminal in a great city is as interesting as it is little understood. The first step is to secure from the local police information as to the favorite haunts of criminals of the class under pursuit, paying special regard in the preliminary inquiries to the possibility of love affairs, for thieves, even more than honest men, are swayed in their lives by the tender passion, and are often brought to justice through the agency of women. With so much of such information in their possession as they could gather, Mr. Stone and his detectives spent their time in likely resorts, picking up acquaintance with frequenters, and, whenever possible, turning the talk adroitly upon the man they were looking for. It is a mistake to suppose that in work like this detectives disguise themselves. False beards and mustaches, goggles and lightning changes of clothing, are never heard of except in the pages of badly informed story writers. In his experience of over 25 years Mr. Murray never wore such a disguise, nor knew of any reputable detective who did. In this expedition the detectives simply assumed the characters and general style of the persons they were thrown with, passing for men of sporting tastes from the East, and, having satisfied the people they met that they meant no harm, they had no difficulty in obtaining such news of McCoy and the others as there was. Unfortunately, this was not much. After going from one city to another on various clues, hearing of one member of the gang here and another there, and in each instance losing their man, the detectives finally brought up in New Orleans. They had spent five or six weeks of time and a large amount of money, only to find themselves absolutely without a clue as to the whereabouts of the men they were pursuing. They were much discouraged when a telegram from Mr. Pinkerton told them that Butch McCoy was back in Galesburg, where they had first sought him. Proceeding thither with all dispatch, they traced McCoy into a saloon, and there three of them, John Smith, representing the Rock Island Railroad, John McGinn, for the Pinkerton Agency, and Frank Murray, working for Mr. Stone, with drawn revolvers, captured him, in spite of a desperate dash he made to escape. 
McCoy's capture was the occasion of much felicitation among the people interested in the matter. Mr. St. John and Mr. Stone were confident that now the whole mystery of the express robbery could be solved and the murderer convicted. But McCoy showed on trial that he had left New Orleans to come north only the night before the murder and had spent the whole of that night on the Illinois Central Railroad. It also appeared that McCoy's associate, Connors, was in jail at the time of the robbery, and that the man, Jeff, was dead. Thus the whole Plunkett story was exploded. 